sowing and reaping. Go into the fields and country lanes in the springtime, and you will see farmers and gardeners busy sowing seeds in the newly prepared soil. If you were to ask any one of those gardeners or farmers what kind of produce he expected from the seed he was sowing, he would doubtless regard you as foolish and would tell you that he does not expect at all, that it is a matter of common knowledge that his produce will be of the kind which he is sowing, and that he is sowing wheat or barley or turnips, as the case may be, in order to reproduce that particular kind. Every fact and process in nature contains a moral lesson for the wise man. There is no law in the world of nature around us which is not to be found operating within the same mathematical certainty in the mind of man and in human life. All of the parables of Jesus are illustrative of this truth, and are drawn from the simple facts of nature. There is a process of seed sowing in the mind and life of a spiritual sowing, which leads to a harvest according to the kind of seed sown. Thoughts, words, and acts are seeds sown and by the inviolable law of things, they produce after their kind. A man who thinks hateful thoughts brings hatred upon himself. The man who thinks loving thoughts is loved. The man whose thoughts, words, and acts are sincere is surrounded by sincere friends. The insincere man is surrounded by insincere friends. The man who sows wrong thoughts and deeds and prays that God will bless him, is in the position of a farmer who, having sown tares, asks God to bring forth for him a harvest of wheat. That which ye sow ye reap, see yonder fields. The sesmum was sesmum, the corn was corn, the silence and the darkness knew, so is a man's fate born. He cometh reaper of the things he sowed. He who would be blessed, let him scatter blessings. He who would be happy, let him consider the happiness of others. Then there is another side to this seed sowing. The farmer must scatter all his seed upon the land, and then leave it to the elements. Were he to covetously hoard his seed, he would lose both it and his produce, for his seed would perish. It perishes when he sows it, but in perishing it brings forth a great abundance. So in life, we get by giving, we grow rich by scattering. The man who says he is in possession of knowledge, which he cannot give out, because the world is incapable of receiving it, either does not possess such knowledge, or if he does, will soon be deprived of it, if he is not already so deprived. To hoard is to lose. To exclusively retain is to be dispossessed. Even the man who would increase his material wealth must be willing to part with, invest, what little capital he has, and then wait for the increase. So long as he retains his hold on his precious money, he will not only remain poor, but will be growing poorer every day. He will, after all, lose the thing he loves, and will lose it without increase. But if he wisely lets it go, if, like the farmer, he scatters his seeds of gold, then he can faithfully wait for, and reasonably expect, the increase. Men are asking God to give them peace and purity, and righteousness and blessedness, but are not obtaining these things, and why not? Because they are not practicing them, not sowing them. I once heard a preacher pray very earnestly for forgiveness, and shortly afterwards, in the course of his sermon, he called upon his congregation to show no mercy to the enemies of the church. Such self-delusion is pitiful, and men have yet to learn that the way to obtain peace and blessedness is to scatter peaceful and blessed thoughts, words, and deeds. Men believe that they can sow the seeds of strife impurity, and unbrotherliness, and then gather in a rich harvest of peace, purity, and concord by merely asking for it. What more pathetic sight 
than to see an irritable and quarrelsome man praying for peace. Men reap that which they sow, and any man can reap all blessedness, now and at once, if he will put aside selfishness, and so broadcast the seeds of kindness, gentleness, and love. If a man is troubled, perplexed, sorrowful, or unhappy, let him ask, What mental seeds have I been sowing? What seeds am I sowing? What have I done for others? What is my attitude towards others? What seeds of trouble and sorrow and unhappiness have I sown, that I should thus reap these bitter weeds? Let him seek within and find, and having found, let him abandon all the seeds of self, and sow henceforth only the seeds of truth. Let him learn of the farmer the simple truths of wisdom. Chapter 12 The Reign of Law The little party gods have had their day. The arbitrary gods, creatures of human caprice and ignorance, are falling into disrepute. Men have quarreled over and defended them until they have grown weary of the strife, and now everywhere they are relinquishing and breaking up these helpless idols of their long worship. The god of revenge, hatred, and jealousy, who gloats over the downfall of his enemies, the partial god who gratifies all of our narrow and selfish desires, the god who saves only the creatures of his particular special creed, the god of exclusiveness and favoritivism, such were the gods, miscalled by us god, of our soul's infancy, gods base and foolish as ourselves the fabrications of our selfish self. And we relinquished our petty gods with bitter tears and misgivings, and broke our idols with bleeding hands. But in so doing we did not lose sight of God, nay, we drew nearer to the great silent heart of love. Destroying the idols of self, we begin to comprehend somewhat of the power which cannot be destroyed, and entered into a wider knowledge of the God of love of peace, of joy, the God in whom revenge and partiality cannot exist, the God of light, from whose presence the darkness of fear and doubt and selfishness cannot choose but flee. We have reached one of those epochs in the world's progress which witnesses the passing of the false gods, the gods of human selfishness and human illusion the new old revelation of one universal impersonal truth has again dawned upon the world, and its searching light has carried consternation to the perishable gods who take shelter under the shadow of self. Men have lost faith in a god who can be cajoled, who rules arbitrarily and capriciously, subverting the whole order of things to gratify the wishes of his worshippers and are turning, with a new light in their eyes and a new joy in their hearts, to the God of law. And to him they turn, not for personal happiness and gratification, but for knowledge, for understanding, for wisdom, for liberation from the bondage of self. And thus turning, they do not seek in vain, nor are they sent away empty and discomfited. They find within themselves the reign of law, that every thought, every impulse, every act and word brings about a result in exact accordance with its own nature, that thoughts of love bring about beautiful and blissful conditions, that hateful thoughts bring about distorted and painful conditions, that thoughts and acts, good and evil, are weighed in the faultless balance of the supreme law, and receive their equal measure of blessedness on the one hand, and misery on the other, and thus finding they enter a new path, the path of obedience to the law. Entering that path they no longer accuse, no longer doubt, no longer fret and despond, for they know that God is right, the universal laws are right, the cosmos is right, and that they themselves are wrong, if wrong there is, and that their salvation depends upon themselves upon their own efforts, upon their personal acceptance of that which is good, and deliberate rejection 
of that which is evil. No longer merely hearers, they become doers of the word, and they acquire knowledge, they receive understanding, they grow in wisdom, and they enter into the glorious life of liberation from the bondage of self. The law of the Lord is perfect, enlightening the eyes. Imperfection lies in man's ignorance, in man's blind folly. Perfection, which is knowledge of the perfect law, is ready for all who earnestly seek it. It belongs to the order of things. It is yours and mine now, if we will only put self-seeking on one side, and adopt the life of self-obliteration. The knowledge of truth, with its unspeakable joy, its calmness and quiet strength, is not for those who persist in clinging to their rights, defending their interests, and fighting for their opinions, whose works are imbued with the personal I, and who build upon the shifting sands of selfishness and egotism. It is for those who renounce these causes of strife, these sources of pain and sorrow, and they are, indeed, children of truth, disciples of the Master, worshippers of the Most High. The children of truth are in the world today. They are thinking, acting, writing, speaking, yea, even prophets are among us, and their influence is pervading the whole earth. An undercurrent of holy joy is gathering force in the world, so that men and women are moved with new aspirations and hopes, and even those who neither see nor hear feel within themselves strange yearnings after a better and fuller life. The law reigns, and it reigns in men's hearts and lives, and they have come to understand the reign of law who have sought out the tabernacle of the true God by the fair pathway of unselfishness. God does not alter for men, for this would mean that the perfect must become imperfect. Man must alter for God, and this implies that the imperfect must become perfect. The law cannot be broken for man, otherwise confusion would ensue. Man must obey the law. This is in accordance with harmony, order, justice. There is no more painful bondage than to be at the mercy of one's inclinations. No greater liberty than utmost obedience to the law of being. And the law is that the heart shall be purified, the mind regenerated, and the whole being brought in subjection to love, till self is dead, and love is all in all, for the reign of law is the reign of love, and love waits for all, rejecting none. Love may be claimed and entered into now, for it is the heritage of all. Ah, beautiful truth! To know now that man may accept his divine heritage, and enter the kingdom of heaven, O oh, pitiful error! To know that man rejects it because of love of self. Obedience to the law means the destruction of sin and self, and the realization of unclouded joy and undying peace. Clinging to one's selfish inclinations means the drawing about one's soul clouds of pain and sorrow which darken the light of truth, the shutting out of oneself from all real blessedness, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Verily the law reigneth, and reigneth forever, and justice and love are its eternal ministers.